so uh, talk today intended to be a pair of applications. So, uh, Gold Rush is. Uh, has anyone was? Sorry, I need some context here. Did anyone go to the Far West talk? Okay, so two persons. Uh, either way, the Far West talk was about uh, this uh, more or less web framework for airline that uh, Louis is developing. And um, in order to make it sort of user friendly, you want to export stats, information about the VM, and uh, events that happen when you execute the applications. And uh, this is basically the two components that we were intending to use to sort of make that available to users. Uh, does this one work? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, me. Um, and, okay, so this is not going to work. Yeah, I'm just moving here instead. Uh, yeah, uh, I used to be the IT guy, the small internet service provider in Gothenburg. And uh, no one likes being the IT guy. So I sort of quit my job, decided to go back to school, and uh, pretend to learn Erlang. Is it actually while I was working? But uh, sort of not the point. Uh, I done some work on eTorrent and Cowboy. And I think <coughs> I probably answered your question on the Erlang IRZ channel. This is usually where I'm at. Um, uh, so basically, while being an IT guy, get really bad experience with systems, usually custom systems uh, that were developed in-house. Uh, you almost have no logging and uh, no stats or whatever. Sort of depends on how good your in-house systems are. But generally, uh, my impression is of them is that uh, they're worse uh, than uh, more established systems like routers or databases and all those things. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, did anyone go to the Folsom talk earlier? Everyone. So, it's kind of a spread, but that one was basically about data like collection from airline. And uh, I heard on the pub yesterday someone was raving about how annoying it is to not have any information about what the system is doing and how it's doing. And uh, so how can we sort of fix this? And uh, I think it's especially important for talking open source Erlang applications, because I mean, you usually have the source code available, but that's only friendly to developers, and often not then either. Um, So we want to collect data and information from uh, running Erlang applications, and that includes the Erlang VM itself. And uh, we want to do it during development, uh, testing, and deployment, so we get better understanding uh, of what's going on. And. Um, So one way to do this is logging. And it's usually done as human-readable text messages. So you get really ill-defined data format, and you usually have to add uh, parsing, uh, add parsers in order to process it after the fact. And 
often they don't even include the context uh, of where this happened. So we see, if we say we get an error in a process and where basically two values were set, there was a module and some argument. Uh, or for, we say eTorrent, we received a block request basically send me data from one peer to another. Uh, I think I had a message there where the process ID, the container the process ID and uh, the parameters. And that doesn't really help if you're trying to correlate this with, say, a Wireshark dump. It doesn't. So we kind of want that uh, provided at runtime for each thing that we collect. And another problem with log levels is as well that you get bug, error, and info. And when you have a problem, you just you switch to the debug log level, and then you have 100 megabyte file afterwards. And that's not very helpful either. And Logger has a really nice feature for sort of augmenting these two levels. It is, you're allowed to add tags to a log statement, and then be able to select on those tags to create a log file containing only the entries that match that. And uh, I think that's kind of a good way to do it. Uh, you also have gen event built into OTP uh, to do this. And it's a single process, and you add handler modules to that, and it's ex executed one by one as the events come in. And uh, it's kind of slow, and you have no filtering of the events, so you always need to send the events to this process and filter it in each handler, um, which is kind of inconvenient as well. Uh, and then there is error logger, which is uh, sort of where OTP sends its its log messages by default. So you somewhat have 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 to use that. But I like one thing about like about error logger, even though it uses GenEvent, is the report functions. Where you base you just supply a property list of values, and usually helps because then you at least you get Erlang terms out of the whole whole history there. Uh, there's also tracing built in, and uh, uh, I was actually planning to use this at. Uh, much greater extent, but uh, it doesn't really work if you want to do this uh, like systematically during the whole runtime of a system. Uh, partly because you can only have one at a time, and uh, there is no flow control, and it doesn't work very well in the d d distributed systems. So. Uh, in the case of, say, you're running CT tests, and you want to log something, and have it included in the common test log. Uh, that made no sense, sorry. Yeah, so basically the only safe way to do tracing in our line is use trace port. It's re relatively safe, but it doesn't work on with distributed Erlang, and you still have the annoying limitation that you can only have one tracer. Uh, D-trace, I was sort of trying out that one. Uh, I'm a Linux user, so I had to install system tap. Uh, and it made me feel like an idiot. So I don't really want to impose that on anyone else. Um, tried D-trace on FreeBSD as well. Uh, and that sort of addresses all my gripes with downing tracing you can have multiple tracers and it's uh, more or less safe and it's called 
Uh, yeah. And you also get the syscalls. But it's sort of, you do it outside Erlang, so you still need to sort of integrate against that. And even then, it's not available to everyone. So sort of waiting for that one to mature a bit. And then there was the Folsom talk earlier as well. Uh, it's mostly focused on numerical metrics. And uh, we don't want to pipe, we don't want to replace Folsom with this thing. Uh, it's better to use that as a sort of back end to analyze events. OK, so most of these things that you can do in Erlang if you just want to sort of get something out of it, out of a running program, is really you're, you have an, a runtime event, but you're only choosing to apply one specific function, which is sort of to log over, to analyze it as a metric. And uh, it's fixed at compile time as well, so you can't sort of insert it while you're running a program or while we're having an issue. And so if we instead say that we want to apply one or more functions for each thing that happens, uh, sort of gets more interesting, because then you can choose to count how many requests you get in, and so on. So or what you do is yeah. Yeah, the, the idea was to sort of see, go through the others to say why. Or you could log them or do whatever. And sort of the characteristics of what we want to do here is that we want to output an event for each certain input and output or condition in the code or action we take. And it should be high level events, so it's not for replacing function tracing. That's a little bit too low level to use like systematically as well. And it's uh, want to focus on out of band information as well. So we're not really relying on any specific outcome of the handling of an event. So you're already relying on the side effect of applying the functions, like sending it to someone else or like that. Um, and the most important thing is we want to dynamically change how the events are handled while running the program. So it's kind of like event, gen event, you can install handlers, remove them, and so on. Um, so if we want to do this, we kind of imply that we want to have a node or cluster level service. Because events usually happen in really inconvenient places. Sort of yeah, within some function, five levels down, and then you want to print. And then you can't really rely on propagating in process ID or something to that point. So, and also if you spawn processes, you can't rely on the process dictionary. It's kind of an obvious thing. Uh, so you don't want code to behave differently if you start spawning processes and evaluate something there instead. So some amount of global state on the node. And I think currently I'm using an ETS table for that. Uh, restrictions, so as I said, it's only for out of band events, so it's not a general pub public subscribe service uh, to use because you don't really want to mix that. And ideally, it would be side effect free as having no effect on the running system. Am I doing okay? Okay, okay so the solution to all problems in computer science is adding one level of indirection. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, the basic idea is uh, instead of saying error logger, error report, 
you emit an event using the gold rush emit function. And then you specify how events emitted using that function should be handled using the with function. And the idea was well is that events should be self-describing. So you shouldn't have to add as much information to them. So if we we know that an event was emitted from a process in a specific application, uh, you shouldn't have to declare that. Uh, so that's the runtime context. We basically have three components for each event. Uh, so it's current time when this happened, the current node current application and current process. So basically, I have four things, so it's easier to correlate with other things that happen. And uh, I think this is actually more important than uh, saying where in the program something happens. Like where in the program text. Because uh, it doesn't really matter if it's on line 10 or 5. Uh, so uh, we can augment this with identifiers. So it's a property list of key value pairs. And so we say that the identifier name should always be an atom, but it, the value may be any term. So this is. An example I put out for eTorrent. It's very similar to uh, some logging I made there. And we can specify which torrent an event is related to and which peer address. Uh, and then you can associate the value with that. So we say that it's for a specific piece of set end length. And that's has anyone written a BitTorrent client? OK. Um, that basically says which data you want. Uh, so we put this together. You have a triplet uh, with the context and the identifier and the values. And this kind of sh shows there. So we'll take the context uh, from the currently executing process. And then you just specify uh, these, the identifiers, and the values. And the intention of these the identifiers is that you should be able to sort of grep uh, in uh, when you when you select the events to handle. So it should actually say display there, right to the right of airline. And it's kind of a silly example if you're just debugging something. And we say, I want all broke requests from eTorrent while it's running, and just print them to stand it out. And there. And the idea of using the identifiers and selecting based on them is that you can filter as early as possible. So, and that's especially important for distributed airline because you don't want to overload a disk port with the bug output. Uh, so you want to say, be able to copy the, those definitions to the nodes where we expect them to happen. And currently I'm storing this in an ETS table, but it would be possible to generate a dispatch module to sort of lower the runtime impact of this. But uh, as, as I said, it's not a replacement for function call tracing. Um, so it doesn't have to be insanely fast, uh, since you're not going to do it in like inner loops or things like that. Uh, and I drop as early as possible as well. Uh, so if you regenerate at a high rate and you just want to sort of glimpse at what's happening 
uh, currently. It's good to sort of sample instead of just logging everything. And if you look at what uh, sort of other industry systems, like get what's Google doing and those things, they're basically saying like at the second sentence to make it relevant, they say that uh, they're sampling to re reduce the impact. So that's a pretty, really common requirement for production systems as far as I can tell. If only to, produce, to protect you from overload and things like that. And then we added uh, status as well. So the idea behind that is to export a value based on the application state. Uh, so whatever the current state of a process is or things like that, and make that reachable. So that's usually a problem as well uh, to gain access to that. So Cowboy Puggy, how many connections open or the current state of a process? And we want to associate that with a function call. So we don't want to sort of impose on users to skim through the manual and look really carefully for the magic function that returns how many connections are open. I think that's actually the case right now. You can't even access it. Well, you could derive that from application events as well. Uh, some can, I guess that's sort of in the wrong order. Uh, so one example of this is the proc file system on Linux. And uh, so it's file oriented, so instead of applying a function, you're just reading or writing to files. And then you get process information there as well. It's sort of kind of like the process info function in Erlang. And it also exports other kernel information. So that's in one example of doing this like on the kernel level. And you're using a tree data structure to sort of make it exportable and browsable uh, to clients. You have SNMP as well, which is both a good and a bad example, I guess. Uh, I like that routers have it, but I don't really like using it. Um, and it's also got a tree structure. You get read write access. And I guess the killer feature, at least for me, is SNMP walk, because then you can at list what's happening or what's available. It's really useful if you get this some obscure piece of equipment and uh, to see what it actually does, not what the manual says it does. And then unspecified, which is sort of more in general. It really depends on the type of service that uh, we want to read the status of. Uh, one thing I kind of encounter quite often is that you're using the service protocol to also export the status of the service. Uh, so in Redis, I think you're using the info command to read it as well. So, And the same with uh, Postgres, as far as I can remember. So. And I guess it makes sense on some level to use SQL to access the stats of an SQL server, but I'm not sure if it's always a good thing. And uh, so we basically wanted to use distributed Erlang to do this. And at least Erlang is like less custom than doing your own TCP-based protocol or banging around UDP packages. With no sense. And the idea here is to reuse <coughs> the context and identifiers who say what you provide information for and uh, sort of what the keys for those are. That would be the name. So it's essentially one component uh, in the path of, say, proc. And so uh, reading it, you just attach the time 
and the value. So you, you should be able to reuse the same thing to do that. Uh, so status API is uh, so we're calling this from we're calling provide from the function or from the process that uh, sort of has the state. So if we did this in Cowboy, we'd call it from the listener server uh, to export the number of connections and which pool they were allocated to and so on. Uh, you can also, it's also possible to do it using an anonymous function as well, so you don't need to add uh, extra code to like export an API, API for that. And you, the idea is that you get the value by applying the function. And then you can find values, so if you want to get everything associated from one application, you just use the same one as I used in the example for handling events from eTorrent. And you could read the values as well. So this is just listing the full context and identifiers. And this is also called a function to get the value. And then, sort of, I guess my personal preferences here for the doing this is to push data instead of uh, polling from, say, Moonin or Nagios or something. Because then you usually end up with a really shitty bash script and a lot of configuration files that lay there and rot. Um, it also has a nice side effect that when a system starts and starts outputting, you're essentially registering yourself in the service. Uh, some reflections from sort of prototyping this is that uh, instead of doing it really neat, adding a lot of setup code, you can do quite a lot of work in the supervisor itself to generate child specifications. So you don't need to add the loops to start child, just do heavy list comprehensions and it should work. Uh, I also sort of found one for all to yield much less error handling code than using one for one, which is kind of have defaulted to before. Because uh, you don't need to monitor and it's much closer to link, which is more airline-y. And uh, I, after spending some time with this, I kind of fell back on using prop lists for passing uh, uh, parameters to processes, like the initial state and data. Because uh, it's especially easier to read in crash reports, because you don't need to remember read to memorize the argument order and what you're expecting it to be and so on. It's also much easier to propagate parameters down the supervisor tree, because if, if I want to add an option, and I have two levels of supervisors, I need to add it on each level, plus the worker. And to make that work, and yes, that's kind of the one. I guess now it's questions. Did I make any sense? Uh, yeah. So we're deferring the actual web interface since I sort of spent too much time making a really bad one, and our web guy is. I guess it's almost already done with our web page, and it's looking beautiful. So we're just going to wait for him to sort of fix that, and it should be done in no time. Uh, questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused about the point when you were doing an emit with um, a torn hash. Yeah. What is what 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 is what are you going to do with that? 
the idea is to uh, pass that to a function. So that would be, like, in that case, it was Erlang display. Right. So, so the way. Um, it would be counting and. So you have some global state that's running somewhere that you can keep track of that. Yeah, exactly. For yeah, that was actually one of the things that I found most annoying because most useful event handlers have some type of state. Uh, so, wh what I did for that one uh, was to just add. Okay, that's confusing. That's why I added the one for all supervisor, or uh, to run the actual handle code. Uh, and currently, it's sort of at the bottom. It's implemented as a module that looks almost exactly like the cowboy HTTP handler module. So you have an init function, you have a handle function, and you have a terminate function, and. Uh, and that's where you would sort of create TTS tables or something like that. Did that answer the question? That's sort of, yeah. Okay. So what is, what is Saloon? Saloon, that's the web interface. So it's basically okay. to browse this and to show graphs and so on. And it's kind of the, it sort of exists for other things. I know React has one as well. But as far as I can tell, it's React specific, and it'd be really great to have one that's more more general that you could bundle with applications as well. So that's where we're, so we're going for here. And what's nice is that you so you can have these emit statements in the code and then tweak the way that they they're routed to, func to specific functions at yeah. runtime. Yeah, it's basically genuine, but a little bit slightly different. I, I don't think I would anyone would use or would like having to implement a gen event handler when they're in a hurry. Just to do that. Mm. Yeah. So, so given that you're emitting a list of properties to say, you know, this is my event. Yeah. Um, and that, as you mentioned, Logger does something similar with the tags. Yeah. Does it make sense to integrate those so that as you log, you can also so, so if you're logging a specific thing every time X happens, does it make sense to hook? I'm just, because I'm the author of logger, obviously. Um, I'm just curious, does it, does, is there some you know, overlap there that would make sense? Uh, yeah, I, I got a lot of inspiration from logger right. for that. And I was sort of trying to argue at the beginning that logger and other things is more or less a special case of, yes. of, of connecting those two things. As much as we love messages and stuff in airline, it's sometimes not always the right thing. Sometimes just want to call back. How are we doing time wise? Yeah. Okay, I can see what you mean. I use, usually just use lists key find, so it crashes if the requirement, required argument isn't there, but that doesn't really work with, for dialyzer in that case, because it can't see which one is which of the types in the, of the entries in that types. More? Any other questions? Awesome, thank you, Magnus. Okay.